Good morning. How is everybody? Doing well? Thank you for giving up your Saturday and coming into the conference. So this is TypeScript for C Sharp developers. And I'm Rachel Appel from JetBrains. I do .NET work and JavaScript and web development. Uh, this talk is for those who have worked in C Sharp, but you're moving over to TypeScript, and you've maybe toyed around with JavaScript for a bit, uh, but don't really have much experience on the client side. So, and sorry for making everybody translate into English so early in the morning. <laughs> That's all I know. Uh, so we'll take an overview of TypeScript, see some of the features, and see why you might actually work with this language. Then we'll take a look at the types, which is kind of an important thing, and the compiler, and then creating and using classes and uh, doing things in an object-oriented sort of style. So an overview. Why would we use TypeScript? Well, type safety is one of the things that we would do for TypeScript. Type is in the name. So way back when TypeScript was first created, uh, the creators took a look at JavaScript and they said, yeah, no. <laughs> no. Uh, so JavaScript, I can and have stood in front of audiences for more than an hour going on about all of the horrible things that JavaScript does to people. Um, so TypeScript is there, or the first edition of it was there to solve some of these problems. And, and one is with types. JavaScript just doesn't care. Everything is just basically a data structure, a dictionary under the hood. And past that, it doesn't, it doesn't care if you're used to working with things like classes and inheritance and making models for programming. It was developed years ago when, remember when browsers, okay, who's old enough for this? Remember Netscape? Uh, old people, yes, we rock, right? So that's what that was created for, to work with a DOM, a document object model, in stuff like IE1 and Netscape and whatever that other one was for like 10 minutes in the 90s. There was some other browser. Uh, and then, yeah, Firefox came along and destroyed all that. Um, so that's the kind of thing JavaScript was made for. It was created in two weeks by um, somebody who I'm pretty sure was drinking for the entire two weeks. <laughs> so some issues came up, right? It's supposed to be for the DOM, and then people took it and they said, okay, we are going to build everything you're not supposed to build with JavaScript, and we're still doing that today. Uh, so that's one of the big things, right? Just having to deal with JavaScript in a way that developers with statically strong type languages are used to dealing with code uh, to kind of bridge that gap a little. Now, since then, JavaScript was decided, oh, might we be aggravating people? <laughs> and they have, um, the standards have evolved through ES5 and ES6. So now, a lot of those features have been implemented in JavaScript. Uh, but we still get some good benefits out of TypeScript anyway. Um, with TypeScript, we could use styling and object-oriented features. And now, you could do this in JavaScript, but if you've tried to do this, create like a full, nice front end, purely in JavaScript, with really nice code that mimics an object-oriented system, then you are also drinking as much as the creator of JavaScript. Right, so um, it, you, at the end, you will be, right? Because it's a lot of code, and there haven't been traditionally much tooling for that code, right? A lot of it has just been whatever editor you're using. Um, so there hasn't been tooling, and there hasn't been support until the last few years uh, for just writing pure JavaScript. 
Uh, but TypeScript helps with a lot of that too. Uh, so you can also target the JavaScript version, so whatever ECMAScript version. Uh, I know everybody likes to write brand new code, but most of us get stuck maintaining super old code, uh, so we have to target that. Uh, if you do end up actually liking JavaScript, I like to pick on JavaScript, but it's really not terrible. Uh, so if you like it, that's fine. Or if you have a code base that is not broken, there is no need to fix it. So you could use your existing JavaScript because TypeScript is a superset of it. Uh, another thing TypeScript gives us is sugar. We like sugar. Uh, so lots of nice c sharpy ways to write stuff and work with stuff. So I'm, I'm down with that. And, you know, I mean, it's basically a superset of JavaScript, so you could run it anywhere. It compiles to JavaScript. Uh, so that makes it cross-platform. Um, also, you just have to have the words cross-platform in there. Uh, this is another reason, this one. We found this one on the internet. See, it's the whole theme of a lot of whiskey goes with JavaScript. So again, uh, TypeScript is a superset of JavaScript. Uh, valid JavaScript code is valid TypeScript code. The TypeScript compiler is totally cool with that. Uh, it will just take that and blend it into the compiled results. Uh, so TypeScript has what's called a transpiler. Uh, it depends on, a lot of people just say compiler, that's fine if you want to interchange the words, unless you're on a very pedantic team that insists on you know, proper terms for everything, then yes, it's a transpiler because it compiles one language, high-level language, into another high-level language. And CompSci students love to argue about that. But who cares? It compiles to proper JavaScript, which is what you need to get your work done. Unless your work done happens to be in a university, and then you're not getting work done. You're just arguing about stuff. Right? That's what happens there. Uh, it's also a gradually typed language. So generally, you can set up types in TypeScript and say, I want this variable to be this type. Uh, but it'll also do type inference for you as well if you don't. Uh, so it's kind of cool that way. Um, I find it interesting in that a lot of developers say, we want this feature. We want to work with types better. So this language comes out, TypeScript. OK, JavaScript people, here you go. Now you have types. Oh, no, but we don't want types all of the time. So you do have things you know, like an any, or you could just use a var. Not that I would suggest that, but you can. And you could just let it type, do the dynamic typing uh, when it wants to. So developers always do that. We want something. And then they get it, and they go, no, we don't always want that. So your starting point is typescriptlang.org. And you go there, or also GitHub, because it's open source. So you could go right to the language and start looking and seeing how they wrote it and complaining about stuff. GitHub is like everybody's favorite place to complain about things. Right? Open those issues if you find a bug. Uh, you can also contribute as well. Right? So it's open source. TypeScript seems to have a bit of a slow uptick in the beginning for adoption. And then one day, the folks at Angular said, you know, I think we should go with TypeScript. And then developers went, oh, Angular, what are you doing? And they said, yeah, we're doing it. So Angular said, went, went with TypeScript, and then all of a sudden, all these other major technologies are like, we're gonna support and embrace and love TypeScript. TypeScript all the things. Uh, so now, popular frameworks. Now, I mean, you know, it compiles down to JavaScript, <laughs> so it works with all this stuff anyway, uh, but a lot of these players have embraced it as, you know, don't just write JavaScript, why don't you write TypeScript when you use our libraries? And a lot of big companies started adopting TypeScript that are not Microsoft as a large company, other large companies, right, it's a public and private. Uh, some governments and things like that. So it's out there in the wild now. It's gained enough maturity now uh, that it, you know, if you're still a little on the fence, 
about moving your team over, you shouldn't really have any issues. Uh, it's not going to just go away tomorrow, necessarily. Uh, also, another thing is, uh, you know, I love these Stack Overflow surveys. Uh, sometimes I agree with them. Sometimes I'm like, what the? Uh, but TypeScript's in there. Uh, and it was in as one of the most loved languages. So it seems that all of the TypeScript developers were having a meeting when this came out, and they all went and voted, uh, along with the Rust and the Smalltalk people. Like, how did Smalltalk get on there? So that's where I'm like, yeah, see, this shows my TypeScript results. But also Smalltalk is on there. We actually have any Smalltalk people in here? Not literally none. <laughs> we could make fun of it. Uh, so usually there's somebody, but yeah. So there you have it. It is, it is very popular. So. Uh, so other things that TypeScript was meant to help with. Developers need to do a couple of things. Understanding code. Right? I often use the words reading code. Sometimes we mindlessly sit there and read code, but the important thing is to actually know what's going on when you read it. Right? So readable code needs to be understandable code. Now, readable code in C Sharp is pretty straightforward if it's written nicely where you can read it. And if you're a Java developer, you can take a look at that and say, yeah, I have an idea of what's going on here. Right? And vice versa, right? with, especially with those two languages. Um, but even if you come from other backgrounds, you can often look at Java code or C Sharp and say, yeah, I, I kind of know what's going on here, even though I don't write this language every day. Um, but with JavaScript, if you don't write it all the time and you start looking at JavaScript, it's basically just like rapid fire WTFs. Right, just what the, what is, why do you do this? Languages do that? What the, I, it, that's all that it is if you are not versed in JavaScript. Uh, so that's something, picking it up out of the gate often can give you a lot of issues. Now, any more in the later versions of ECMAScript, uh, like five and six, it's much easier. Things are a little bit more stable and structured, but traditionally, JavaScript is just let People do whatever they want, whenever they want. And as we have found out, people will do whatever they want, whenever they want, even if they don't know what they did you know, the next day. If you go back to read it and you, what is this code doing? I don't know. I, I just wrote it yesterday. So. Uh, so along with that is maintaining code and fixing bugs and things like that. So JavaScript bugs are the least fun bugs of all. Right, because, and it's weird, it's like a dual-edged sword. JavaScript is very powerful, it does lots of cool stuff, and it does not have a compiler to tie you down. But that's also the bad part of it, it does let you do lots of things and it does not have a compiler to tie you down. So that can make bugs very sneaky and very easy to pop up if you don't know the ins and outs of the language. Uh, the other thing we do, not as much, I guess, is writing new code. We want to, but we have to do the maintenance first. Uh, so writing new code is the easiest part. Right? You don't have to know what you're doing. You just write the code. We'll read it tomorrow. <laughs> yes. Uh, so those are some things that were put in mind by the team when they started putting together TypeScript. And remember, some of those issues in the early days needed to be solved before it could start maturing and migrate into the ecosystem that it is today. Uh, so if we want to go and install it, again, back on TypeScript um, on GitHub, you could go there and get it. Uh, easier though, NPM. Everybody has some sort of package manager. If you're using something different, all the standard package managers have a package for TypeScript out there. So just go to NPM, install it. Uh, if you just want to do it per project, you could do the save dev on NPM and just save it. Right? So that works fine. Uh, once you have it, uh, we'll take a look at how it works now. Or not. <laughs> Okay, so apparently if we move 
a wire, everything goes black. And, oh, it's just like code. <laughs> Barely touch it, things break. Yes. So how does it work? That was kind of ironic, right? How does it work? It, it shuts off. <laughs> I, I've, I've written that code. <laughs> so we have TypeScript code. We write in TypeScript. And you could throw JavaScript in there, that's fine. You can, you can mix, consider it one as the other when you're writing the code. Then we take that and compile. And th this is like any other code. C Sharp, you write that code, you compile it. But we get JavaScript output from TypeScript. So it goes through the TypeScript compiler, gives us JavaScript. And it'll give us JavaScript in the flavor <coughs> that we want. ES5, ES6, or whatever we're targeting. Uh, so that's the basics of how it works. You can just, if you want, okay, who's the person in this audience? It, you could use Notepad and go to the command line and run TSC with a couple of switches and compile it. There's always a Notepad person in the audience. Like, I hate IDEs, I hate editors, everything I hate but Notepad, okay. You can do that. Uh, if you're using, I work for JetBrains, so Rider or WebStorm are very good tools. And I liked them before I joined the company. They're very good tools for TypeScript and JavaScript development. So they'll let you configure your IDE to compile exactly what you want and how you want it. Uh, and then you get the JavaScript output. Same thing if you use v VS or VS Code, right? So any good IDE that works with TypeScript will run this for you. You could set up the options in a tsconfig file, so we'll look at that in a minute. Now programs are a lot like programs elsewhere as far as the general way that programs work. So you have a TypeScript program. In that you'll have modules. You can actually put namespaces in here as well, uh, although sometimes uh, there are some camps of people who kind of frown upon that and go right for the module. So that works for me, right? So you could take a module. In that, you could make classes. So this looks very C-sharp-like right now, right? Inside of those, you can have various members, right? So now, if this is the only slide you saw, and I erase the word TypeScript, you could very well think that this is a Java or C-sharp program, right? Because we have modules or, you know, some kind of containment, right, a namespace, classes, and, and members. But we know that it compiles to JavaScript, so we know that's probably not what's going on under the hood. Uh, so, no, not really. But this is, for us, as developers, when we're writing our code and architecting our programs, uh, we can consider it organizationally like that. Now, as part of that program are types. Right, so we need types. Uh, historically, now these have changed over the years. We first started by going to those little typings, and these should still be available. And typings are, since it's JavaScript, right, a superset of JavaScript, and if you want to add types to it, they just don't come out of thin air. You have to make them. Now, if you think of, say, .NET, you have the .NET framework, and it's base class libraries, and the types are are in those libraries, in the global assembly cache. Well, JavaScript doesn't have these kind of ideas, like a, a global place for a bunch of types or anything like that. So what we need to do is we need to create them and have a set of working types. So the TypeScript creators went ahead and made some typings. So some language typings, so things like your basic variable types you would work with, primitives and objects and other types. But then, if I'm a developer and I'm creating a framework like React, or even if it's not a general purpose framework for public consumption, maybe it's even more of just a private set of typings for my company, I can go in and make a JavaScript file and actually set it up in a structure that just defines a bunch of types. So that's what's in these, no matter what version you go to. Nowadays, we just go to NPM 
and we get packages that have an at types on the end of it. Um, but historically, we would go to some of those other places in the past, and you could still go there and browse uh, some of the typings, the TSDs and things like that. So for example, if I had the, the Lodash tool and I wanted to install it, this is a handy little uh, Swiss army knife of a library. It just kind of does everything that you want, all kinds of cool little things. So if I wanted to download this and install it, I could just do an npm install and then say save Lodash, right? or whatever package manager you use that hosts Lodash. Uh, then I could go and install the type definitions for it, and after the save, well, before npm, I'll say type acquisition, npm, install, and then save, at types, and then that library. So I just twist the syntax a bit, and then I can install those type definitions. So it basically just gets that typing library for me, puts it into this installation folder, and it puts a .dts, right, so it just changes the extension, and then there I have it, right, so I have a set of types uh, to go with that library. Uh, so if you're actually using Lodash, there's where you could get the types for it, but all of your, you know, popular frameworks that support TypeScript now have these type libraries that you can acquire and use. So the cool thing about the type libraries is, it's awesome for everybody but notepad person. Notepad person gets no love, right? Because notepad does not have like IntelliSense or tool tips or any of those cool little things that an IDE or an editor would give you. Um, so having these types allows tools to go in and look ahead and do some processing uh, to help you out and make it so that you can more efficiently write the code. Right? And then, of course, when we run the compiler, it uses the information in these files to do some of that type checking. Now, for the, the transpiler or the compiler, it is TSC. If you want to run it at the command line, and when you run something out of your IDE, this is what it does. TSC with the dash P and the path, <coughs> At any time, you could go out to your command line and do a TSC uh, dash dash version or help, and you can see what version you're running. You can get some help. And there is a nice, just a nice long list of compiler options at typescriptlang.org. Now, I have some on some slides here uh, coming up <coughs> as well that we can look at. Um, for compilation, some things you want to do first. And so I have them here in Rider, but it doesn't matter if you're using VS Code or something like that, that's fine also, make that a little bigger. So just a piece of JSON, a little chunk of JSON in here, and I could have my compiler options. And some of the things I might do is, here like target, in this case I'm targeting ES5. <coughs> uh, I can always say allow JS, right? So I'm gonna put some regular JavaScript in here. Something else you might want to do as well, uh, there might be a slide on this, I forget. It's been a while since I gave this talk. Uh, so there's source map. Uh, you'll notice when you do the compilation, you'll start with these TS files, and it creates the JS output. But if you have this source map equal true, it also creates this little file that has the name .js dot map. And if I open this up, you're, you're generally not going to need to go in here. It's just one gigantic JSON, piece of JSON in here with a bunch of googly glop. Most of, that's what most of it is. Um, and it basically just has mappings for debugging and tools basically what that's for, right? It's a source map. So it takes TypeScript code and it maps it to that JavaScript output. Now some things that usually rely on this mapper is A, debugging tools, like Writer uses this, Visual Studio uses that, right? Those kind of tools. Uh, but also web browsers. If you think about how web browsers work, right? You would not be able to just create a TypeScript.ts file 
and then just deploy that file. Right? Even though I already said, well, it's still valid JavaScript. It is, but the browser doesn't know that right? because it's not been produced into JavaScript that browsers or JavaScript hosts can understand, which at this point in time is basically browsers, uh, Microsoft Office, and a couple others. Actually, some operating systems let you just run JavaScript. Yeah, great idea. Um, <laughs> yeah, earlier versions of Windows found out that's maybe not the best idea. Just let people run little scripts without any warning or anything. Uh, so this mapping file will map code to code. Right? So it helps for those tools. So if I so if I want to go and deploy something, I need to deploy those JavaScripts. Right? And if I want tools to work with this, I could deploy the maps as well. Right? And in that way, debugging tools and F12 tools and stuff like that can pick that up and, and work with that. Right? So that, that'll help out a bit. So we don't need to come in here and modify this. It's just there, right? just there to work with. Now, depending on what compiler options you set, uh, in this case, I just have a tiny sample with some TypeScripts. And by default, when you generate that JavaScript and possibly the map, yeah, so actually if you go to deploy to production, you don't need the maps at that point. Right? So you could set that up in your build process. Uh, but now, TypeScript, JavaScript, the map, by default, it all just compiles right in the same directory where the TypeScript file is. You might want that, that's fine. For this tiny demo, that's fine. But you can also, or instead, create a folder for all your scripts to be outputting. So you can have your type scripts in whatever kind of structure you want, like maybe a models folder or scripts folder or whatever. And then you can take all of those and then just have the compiler create the .js files in one output location. That's okay too. So you would set that up in here as well. All right, so anything you want to set up for the compiler to do, you just do it in a JSON file. And of course, JavaScript's all about JSON. Uh, other compiler options, paths, source maps, so I talked about all these. There's so some basic checking and things in the ECMAScript version. Uh, here's a few more, but if you go to that link I gave you, you'll get the most current options that are available. Uh, but here is where you could see the um, output directory and files and where you could put stuff, what you might want to target. Uh, if you're using things like common JS, stuff like that, right? So if you want to incorporate that, uh, all kind of different things. Uh, if you want isolated modules, so you could transpile each file separately. So there's tons and tons of options. These are just some of the basic, those are just some basic options. There are many more at that link, so you might want to go check them out and see exactly how you want this to compile. Some other options are like strict checking. If you're used to an option strict in some languages, few languages has, has this. Uh, if you're from the Microsoft side of development, VB is probably the most popular one that has an option strict. Now I know who the VB developers are because you're smiling, right? You're like, I know that one. Uh, but yes, you could say, I want strict type checking. Right? So you'd set that. Uh, also, strict null checks or uh, no implicit this. Right? So it'll raise errors on this expressions within any type and you know certain little tweaks and compiler options that you might set. So here's a few just for the type checking specifically. So these all just go into that tsconfig JSON file. And as you see here in the IDE, I just have it in the root here, right? So as long as your IDE can pick up and see where that JSON file is, you're good. Uh, so writer just picks that up right out of the root. Uh, so does VS Code as well. So for the language types, uh, there are a number of primitive and object types. Uh, there is, this is the fun JavaScript part. There's, there's this any type, which defeats the purpose of TypeScript. So you know somebody, you're gonna have someone on your team who's gonna use this, right? Because that person is, there's one on every team, right? My friend calls him Ed, 
just gave him kind of a nickname. Ed did this today. Yeah. Yeah, so we all know this person. If you don't know this person, guess who it might be? Yeah, consider that. So here's the any type, right? Basically makes it go back to JavaScript not caring about a type. <laughs> Which, yeah, developers, we want types. Uh, yeah, but not, not all the time. That, that person. So maybe avoid that one because it kind of defeats the purpose of TypeScript. Um, but for primitives, number, string, boolean, ah, nice, familiar, comfy types, comfort types, right? kind of like comfort food. Uh, nulls, we also have some advanced types like unions and intersections, right? So we could do, do some fancy stuff. Uh, good old classics like undefined void object, right? So uh, we have those. Uh, ES, I forget which ES, came out with symbol. So you can actually use symbol types in your key value pairs, so symbols as keys. Uh, of course, functions, enums, and a never type. So you do get a nice wide range of actual types now. Uh, there were a few types in JavaScript, despite the fact that it kind of, you know, snubbed its nose and pretended there weren't. There are a few. And when it comes down to it, at the very base level of everything, in JavaScript, everything is a dictionary. It has a key and a value. And to JavaScript itself, pure JavaScript, that's all anything is and that's all it really cares about. It doesn't care what you call it. It just sees it as that kind of a structure. Uh, TypeScript allows us to take that and enhance it so it's something that humans can actually work with a little bit more easily. So there's, again, don't do that, the any type. You could, you could just cram anything in there, which, again, just what, might as well at that point just do a var and then get it over with. And then at that point, you might as well just stay with JavaScript, right? Because you don't need TypeScript. Uh, for declaring variables, there is still a var statement, but why? Again, this is kind of like any. Right? Uh, var is nice, but it has some issues such as like scoping and it makes things look like they might, especially when you come from C-sharp, right? So you have very specific scoping laws in C-sharp um, in which if you declare a variable, you could see it in a certain location. In JavaScript, it doesn't work the same way and a lot of C-sharp developers will declare a variable, maybe inside of an if block, just to find out that it has escaped and it can be modified outside. And it's <coughs> things like that are little things, but they cause very sneaky <coughs> bugs, right? And when you use var, it tends to work in those more traditional JavaScript ways, because it is JavaScript. So go with the new stuff. Use lets and const, right? So you can set a let or a const, and a const is the same type of notion as a constant that you would have. So for just a standard variable declaration, you could set a let in the block and where you want to use it, and that should work. Uh, so they have block scoping. Uh, var doesn't, right? It, it has JavaScript fun scoping, is what I call it. But it's not really fun. Yeah, JavaScript is the not always fun kind of circus. It is a circus, just not always fun. Uh, something else that we get since we work with types, it's not just about declaring variables. Um, if you have arguments in a method somewhere, you could declare types on those. If you have returns, and also it does type inference for you. So if I go and take a look at some TypeScript code in here, let's make that a little bigger. No, bigger, bigger, that way. That's too big. So here I have this little bank account sample. I have an open account, right? And this is very old code. So exactly what I told you not to do five minutes ago is all over this code, right, with var statements. Uh, so I'm gonna go and use this as like a refactoring demo later, right, because, um, nope, we wanna use let and const. So wherever you see this, actually you'll see, oh, writer is like, hey, what are you doing? This is kind of ridiculous, right? Change that to a uh, let or const. <coughs> uh, but here, for our type annotations, 
Uh, if I'm just opening a little account, I might need the name and the amount that they're going to open. And we don't need any other information for people to put money in this bank. This is a very loose bank with very few business rules, right? So just as a small demo. But we can see uh, the type annotations. So just a colon and the type name. Right? It's a string and number. So I know what those types are when I call this. Uh, so when I call open account from anywhere, tools should be able to pick this up and say, oh, it expects a string and a number. And if I try to pass in a number and a number, it's going to get upset. Or actually, if it's two numbers, it'll consider that first one a string, right? But if I do, say, opposite, number and a string, right, it's not going to like the string for the amount, right? So it does have to match the types. Uh, and in this case, it just creates a little account ID and returns that, you know, just a string ID, right? So there, the colon and the string is my return type. So syntactically, it's just a tiny bit different from C Sharp, but it's not so difficult that after looking at it a few times, you just get used to the syntax, right? So that's just a small syntax change, uh, but it's the same thing, right? I'm applying the types and then enforcing them. All right, so I can annotate things with types that you'll see. Uh, all this, also, you'll notice some things like class keywords as well, and some other cool things that are very C-sharp-like. And then C-sharp developers always get that happy look on their face, and they're like, oh, finally, this is stuff I can read. All right, same even with some Java folks. Uh, Enum is another one. Right, nice, comfortable type, right? So you can create enums uh, like that. You can even do string ones. Uh, interfaces, right, classes. And they interface, like that first one looks very much like C Sharp. Uh, the second one, uh, just a slight difference in tax, right, where, where I'm actually declaring it as well. Uh, some other types, a good old null, undefined, and void. So nulls are unknown values, right, as they should be. Undefined is generally a property that doesn't exist or has not. Uh, something can also be set to define undefined, right, specifically. But generally, when you haven't defined something, it doesn't exist yet. And void, we tend to use that for return types, right? So now we can explicitly set these in JavaScript, right, by using TypeScript. Uh, along with types, we do have type assertions or uh, faux casting, if you will. Uh, because of the way types work, it's not a true cast. So all the computer science people with degrees can come in and argue about, is it a real cast? Is it just a conversion? Is it an assertion? Uh, whatever. The fact is you get to move from one type to another in your day-to-day. -day. Yeah, we have business problems to solve outside of academia. So uh, in here, we could take stuff and convert it back and forth as we need to. So you can use bracket syntax or the as keyword. So either works. Uh, and it's similar to some of the familiar .NET languages. Uh, you can also alias types as well. So it doesn't make a new type. It just does what it says. It's an alias. So you can alias types and use them like an interface. Right? So that's a nice little feature of TypeScript. Uh, and then we get, oh, there's union types as well. And I have a sample in the demo I'll show you in a minute. Uh, so you can actually take, some, or something like this. This would work as a union type. Uh, so here I could have red, blue, green, in this case strings. And then I could determine which color to choose with an if or a switch or some other kind of branching statement. Uh, so we get those to work with, right? In this case, strings. Uh, so union types, we don't tend to use stuff like that in C-sharp a lot. Um, so you get a lot of the familiar C-sharp stuff, but then you get some extra cool little things that you get to use as well on top of it, like the unions and string literal types. Now, you can set types to be read-only, or properties in this case, which would be a type. Uh, you can actually use a read-only keyword or... Um, if we're creating a class, you can actually use just a getter without a setter, which is what you do in C-sharp. Uh, but also, a lot of languages have a keyword 
So it's pretty easy to see what's going on. So you get something like read only. Uh, also, there's generics. All right, so a little bit more outside of the scope of just an hour, but you do have them. They're available, uh, so you could use them. Let's take a look at some type declarations and classes. Uh, we already saw the DT and DS file and all those things, uh, but here's the official slide for it. I always get ahead in this talk on the, the DTSs. Uh, and then object-oriented TypeScript. So let's just go right into the code for this, this one. Right. There's a lot of different ways you can do it. In this case, I just went with a namespace, and this serves as some legacy code. So if you do pick up a project with some TypeScript in it already, uh, it might be done this way. So you could have a namespace, or I could have started with just a module. Um, and modules, just using the module keyword, is a little bit more of a modern way of doing it. Right? But um, I started with TypeScript more in the early days. Right? So some of my code is still a little bit, a uh, little bit older, which is nice because then you can see how it's evolved, maybe from back then. Uh, in here, and you get the same export, I can say I have this class or an interface, and in this case it's a little bank account. So I have a bank account class, and I use the class keyword, so nice and comfortable and familiar for C-sharp. Right, so I have this bank account. Uh, and then I can say export. Export is a bit like a public in that this will now be available outside of this namespace or module. All right, so I can say anything that I put an export in front of will allow me to export it that way. And then on the other side, I could use either a reference or an import to pull that in and work with that. And if you work with JavaScript a bit, you might actually do like an import on a lot of popular libraries, right? You have a few imports at the top of a file where you go to use them. Uh, so here I have this bank account. Uh, this one's pretty clear. I mean, it's the constructor. And often it's the name of the class. In this case, it's just the word constructor. So it could not be more clear that is what that piece of code is doing. Uh, so I just use the constructor keyword. Uh, then in here I have some properties and methods. All right, so here I have account type and account holder name. And you can see for the name, right, it's just a string type. And you can see I have a private variable. And then the public get and set that work with it. So my private variable just holds a string. And because I'm working with a string, then of course the others also are a string. Now in the land of TypeScript, we would tend to do our, it's very much like C Sharp, right? I have my private and then the name of my private member uh, even the notation here with the little underscore is very similar. And then I have public, my get, and then the name of whatever my get is. So in this case, account holder name. And I return a string, and then I just return the account holder name. And here's where you could apply a little logic or formatting or something like that to display the information nicely. On the set side, I have my set, of course, same matching name, account holder name, as the get. And for your value, the notation is just v, colon, and then your type. Right? So that can tell me, oh, that's going to accept whatever that type is as the value on the right side of the equals when we assign a value to this property in the calling code. And then inside of here, I can go ahead and do whatever kind of logic I need to work with that piece of data. Uh, not really much logic in here, I'm just setting the private variable, right? So I've just encapsulated it uh, in, in OOP terms, uh, and that's all. Uh, so here, here I get my publics, privates, right? Get and set. So that's, other than just the syntax being slightly off, very much behaving like C sharp at a high level, right? I can look at this code, I could, fairly easily see what it's doing. Uh, I don't need to spend a lot of time going, uh, is this a property? What does this do? Oh yeah, I see. You know, so you don't have that other legwork when you come over from something like C Sharp. Uh, here, both with that account type, which that's an enum, right? So there's an enum hanging out in here somewhere. 
Uh, also, I have this balance and a few others, and you see it's just the get. So I could use the read-only, but if I'm just doing a get, that's all I can do, right? That's all I can do is just return that value. Uh, so here I'm just returning a balance. And you see I could use this keyword, which works much more, it's much more behaved in TypeScript. Uh, they kind of reined it in a little. In JavaScript, the this keyword is, it has a little party all the time when you're not looking, right? So generally we think of this as referring to the current executing instance of a class, but technically in JavaScript there's no classes, so that can't be what's happening, right? Because JavaScript just has those dictionaries. So this is often the currently executing block of code that it's being worked with. But sometimes, if I'm dealing with DOM objects, this can actually switch over and become a DOM object or some other piece of code. Uh, so depending on what the context is, this changes quite a bit. And if you've used some frameworks like jQuery, certain things cause this to change, like a closure. If you add a closure somewhere, this will change to what's in the closure, right? So things like, you might have this. As a matter of fact, the biggest manifestation of the this thing, that is the weirdest word to pick, right? The word this, it's just too common. Um, if you've ever seen, if you've done a lot of JavaScript where you've seen this pattern, where somebody will set, they'll say var self equal this, and they'll trap the variable this, and then go on and do some work, and then refer to self. Or sometimes they'll say that equal this, right? If you've seen that, this is what's going on, right? This is having a little party when you don't expect it to, and it's changing value when you need to track it. Uh, so TypeScript helps kind of make this a little more clear, right? What, what's going on and what this is. Uh, so if I'm saying this, and it's inside of the context of a class keyword, I could feel pretty good that it's this class. Uh, some of the rest of the code here is just basically standard code you might see in a class, right? So here's a deposit, and I'm just, you know, here's a number function, so I'm just making sure that uh, what I'm grabbing is numbers, right? Deposit, withdraw, right? Not any fancy, complicated stuff, just some basic things to show the types and the fact that it looks very much like C-sharp when we're writing the code day to day. Now, some of the structural differences under the hood are, well, different, right? Um, but often, if we're just creating an object-oriented model, like we would in C-sharp, where I have, you know, a product, and then maybe a bicycle, which inherits from product, <coughs> and then a unicycle, which inherits from bicycle, or something like that, modeling and writing the code for those becomes a lot more easy because we can just focus on the business side of it and just create classes and things like that rather than dealing with JavaScript. Uh, so you see I have a withdraw and a, an open account and a deposit and uh, interest rate, setting the interest rate, uh, even inheritance. All right, so I have this savings account class, and instead of the inherit keyword, it just extends my bank account. And the concept of inheritance works the same way, right? You inherit, and then you could work with it. Uh, here in the constructor or anywhere, if I call super, all right, it's just calling one level up, right? So we're used to things like that. Uh, and then here's another one, an investment account that extends the bank account. So I'm just setting the account type, uh, a little string account type, savings account, right? And then checking account. Uh, here's where I've changed things a little bit. If I take a look way up at the top, I had declared a small interface. So this allows us to work with this structure very much like we would work with C-sharp interfaces. So I make an interface, interface keyword. So again, very familiar the name, and then no implementation. I just lay out the rules, 
all right, of the interface. Uh, so if I go back down to the checking account, then here I see it's going to inherit from the bank account, but it's a checking account, so we're going to charge people lots of fees. That's what the bank does. Um, I always find that weird because when you have no money is when they are asking you for money, right? You don't have money, so they charge you money for not having money. I don't think they understand how not having money works, but I don't run a bank. There's probably a lot of reasons why. That's one of them. Uh, but here, again, I could call from the checking account to its parent uh, bank account. And because I implemented the fee interface, uh, then here I could actually implement it here, right? Because I asked to inherit that um, that piece, right? So here I have charge fee, and then just you know checking the balance and not a really big fee. Right? So if it's greater than a thousand, no fee. But if you don't have any money, we're going to charge you. That's how the bank works. Right? I think that's the the only piece of business logic that actually mirrors the bank. It's right there. So, uh, but here you can see how you could actually inherit and extend an interface as well, right? Or implement an interface. Now, the TypeScript compiler, when I run TSC, like if I have this implement fee, but I don't actually have this method, just like in C Sharp, it's gonna say, hey, you said you're gonna implement this interface, but you didn't. So that's what that will give us. It will tell us, you know, you need to enforce that. You need to write that code. Uh, so that will give us the same kind of a, a warning. Now, looking through this code, it is a nice sample. There's roughly 100 lines, and that's with some white space even. Uh, so there's nothing very fancy in here. Right? But if I were to look through it, I can, I can see what's going on. <laughs> nothing, nothing is going on in this code. We will do the just the right way. There we go. Okay. So, you know, if I look through here, it's, you know, not difficult. Right? So junior developers can look through and say, oh yes, it's a bank account, deposit, withdraw, checking accounts, things like that. Okay. But if I were to do this in JavaScript, and not, all right, so there's a few ways to do this in JavaScript. One is just hacking it together, which is kind of the JavaScript way for a lot of people. But if you were to be the JavaScript purist and actually sit down and write the code to do pure JavaScript, no TypeScript, and make it mimic an object-oriented model, that's where it, even this small sample becomes kind of not thrilling, right, uh, to be nice about it. Uh, so you do have to use a lot of patterns and do a lot of legwork to get everything correct. Now JavaScript has the notion of a prototype, and that's how JavaScript does inheritance, this prototype thing. And if you've ever looked through purest JavaScript, you will see that the actual word prototype or if you've gone into F12 tools or any kind of browser tools, you ever look at an object, any object, and you expand it, and you'll see this little prototype thing, and you're like, what's that? And you click it, you'll see another, and you click it, you see another. And then three hours later, literally, because you're still, you're still clicking them, because the prototype is this property and behind the scenes, it does a lot of interesting juggling with this property where, because that's how it does inheritance, inheritance uh, in JavaScript, it actually creates structures on that, dangles them off of that prototype property. So that's why it's prototypal. Now there's a, a big lengthy academic explanation of how it does that. For our day-to-day -day coding, we generally don't need to know that. Actually, even if you're doing some of this, you don't always need to know that. But we, it's nice to know it's there, right? So if we're using TypeScript, we could kind of ignore this. That's nice. But you will see this prototype stuff all over the place. And you might, if you actually do it in the pure way, 
you would actually have to refer to this prototype. So here's the kind of stuff you see. Right? And you'll actually have to use a lot of ifies, right? Or immediately executing function expressions. Right? So I'll have to use those. So here I'm gonna see like, well, what's going on? Let's set up some, some housekeeping code before I even get to the class and working with that. Uh, so here it does some of that. Uh, so this is code. If you look at this, the first like 12 lines, you are not seeing what's going on within a, like 20 seconds, right? Unless you, you would have to be doing this every single day. And even then, if it's early and I see this code, I'm like, I am going back to bed. This is just nonsense, right? If I see this before like 11 a.m., this is, sorry, I'm showing this to you before 11 a.m. So <laughs> this is why people are sleeping. Um, so, so there's that. I mean, you see this, and I'm like, oh, yes, well, there's a bug in here. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> so this is code I don't want to write. So, and this is because it takes our code and makes it beautiful, generated, pure JavaScript the way you're supposed to do it, um, the very fancy pants, academic, and proper way. Um, it's, it's just a giant pain in the ass, let's put it that way, to have to write this code. So you're writing that code. While you're writing that code, business problems are sitting there going, can I have some attention, please? And they're, they're not getting fixed. Uh, here we get to more manageable code. Oh, look it. So it took my namespace and it made a giant variable out of it. Oh, sneaky JavaScript. That is what you're doing. That's what you would have to do. And then I would have to wrap, now, so classes are those prototypes, that's how it does inheritance. But everything in JavaScript is one of those dictionaries. But we wanna take it and wrap it, so we literally actually wrap it in parentheses. And if I go to the bottom here, I'll see another matching one somewhere. Yep, down here, one of these. Uh, and then you'll often see at the end, you've maybe done this pattern, or if you've done jQuery, you've seen this where it has the parens, parens at the end, and then little empty ones, right? And that means go ahead and execute all that right now, right, an immediate function. Um, so you would have to do stuff like that so that it actually runs properly and all of that. Uh, but then I have this variable, and then I'm gonna create a big old function, like a giant function, that then has little nested functions in it, right? So it has lesser functions. Right, and I have to make sure I get the right amount of functions, right, so that I can actually structure it so it behaves conceptually like a class, right? And then here, oh, okay, oh, wait, that's the constructor, right? So that's actually not too bad, right, because it has the name of the thing, right? I want to say the class, but it's not the class, right? Uh, so here, okay, well, that would be the constructor. Uh, and here, okay, look, this is just ugly and annoying, and I've had to write this code, and I've never really liked it. Uh, I would, like, JavaScript working specifically with the DOM is, I'm perfectly happy doing that. But when I have to actually write the business stuff to, to model for a front end, then I get all, like, grumpy and stuff because of this, right, and it's before TypeScript. So then if I actually wanna do proper function, or proper properties, in JavaScript, I have to take the object and say that I actually want to define a property because that's going to dangle it off of that prototype as opposed to somewhere else that it shouldn't go, right? And then I have to say, well, what? Well, I want to define a property on its prototype and I want to call it this. And uh, these little pieces here are little helpers from Rider. And then I'm going to say, well, in this case, it's the account type, so it's only a um, read-only or a getter. Right, and then, and here's some of the other stuff. You'll see this in those DTSs, right, in the type files. You'll actually see a lot of these. So each property gets a whole bunch of metadata with it. Each dictionary, each item that you see in JavaScript gets metadata. So if I look at the, any of those types, you'll see that they have a whole bunch of stuff like enumerable, configurable, a whole bunch of abols in there and other things. Uh, for now, this is what we need as the bare minimum just to define a basic string property. But look at it. 
Here's the syntactic sugar. We don't have to write that. I just do a getter and setter. All right, so there's this, right, or this, right? So just by looking at it, one of these things might be slightly easier to read through faster, especially for junior developers. I'll let you decide which one. I know which one I like, right? Uh, but this is the pure way, so I'd have to go through and write it. So there's a lot more code, and quite frankly, it's ugly, right? And you may say, oh, come on, now you're just being shallow. Yes. <laughs> there is something to be said about style and ugly code. If you have to look at ugly code all day, it sucks the life out of you. It, honest to God, it does. You ever look at just ugly code all day, by the end, you're back to that whiskey bottle again from the beginning of the talk. It, because it is harder to read. Ugly text is harder to read. It, it is, literally. So this is ugly. Right? It might work. It might be the proper way. It might be the elegant coding way. But it's ugly if you have to maintain it. Right? So, and it just goes on like this, and it doesn't stop like ever. It's awful. Oh, here's something. Oh, that's not terrible. Or it's maybe less terrible. Let's, let's put it at that gradient. And then, okay, so that was looking normal for a while. Like, once you get used to this prototype, right, then okay, okay. And then you're like, wait, what? No. That's where the the parens really were. They weren't at the bottom, right? So that's the end of the bank account class. All right now we go to the others. So if I wanted to inherit, oh, good fun here. Wait, is that, is that one or two underscores, right? Like, what, like what's going on here? Uh, that's actually not the important thing. But if I look at this, so okay, now I'm going to, wait, what was this again? Let me go up to the top and look. Right, so that was a big old bar, right? Oh, up here. Right, so stuff like that, right? You may have tools to help you, but nonetheless, you're going back and forth with a lot of nonsense here. That you, the TypeScript makes it that you don't have to do this, right? Is the exercise of aggravating everybody so early with this code, right? So you would have to write all of this to do it the proper way, a proper object model in pure JavaScript, or you know, you could just come in here and say class, bank account, right? And gets and sets and, and write it in a style. If you're coming from C Sharp and you've not written JavaScript, it's going to be a lot faster and a lot more error free, right? Nothing's completely error free, but it, there will be far fewer errors than if you had to turn over to this completely foreign style, right? Uh, but here's how we would have to create and work with something that would be considered inheritance in JavaScript. And then down here later, I get to the checking account, right? And that also, uh, ah, no, don't, that's okay. It's generated, I could just delete the file and have the compiler create it again, but that does not help you read it, right? But here, all right, so there's my checking account, which, has a lot of the same stuff, but then I have my charge fee in here. That's the most normal code in this block. Um, but it just, if I look at this, I'm like, okay. So I see what's going on here. I see it's inheriting, it's doing this. But what is this? It, it's not evident that that is supposed to be an interface. Now I have to, you know, if I'm looking just purely at the JavaScript, now I gotta dig around and see what that is supposed to be. Well, I mean, it's off the prototype, so is, that's what JavaScript sees as an interface, right? Remember, none of these things actually exist in JavaScript, right? We've made them all up in TypeScript. It's all just a dictionary to JavaScript, and everything dangles off the prototype for doing this. So that's, it's just this thing on prototype again, right? So, but it's not evident by looking in the code, so it makes it far less readable. Uh, once I get down to the bottom, um, this little piece, that one's easy. Oh, so they put a little marker in here to say, hey, I generated a map. You could use it. Tools. Go ahead, tools. Use this map. Right. 
Um, so that's the JavaScript that just a simple model, I mean, the lines of code are not terribly longer. I mean, you're talking like 30 lines for a simple example like this. Uh, but if I was doing much more complex things, and you probably are, right? Um, that could get very, very much like a big ball of spaghetti. Uh, for the user interface, this is actually pretty easy too. If I wanna just do straight up JavaScript, here's a very good old fashioned JavaScript, right? Even in a window on load, because throwing jQuery out the window. Um, so here, get element by ID. I remember using this like decades ago and then for several years it was like, oh, we are too good for that. We're gonna use a little dollar and cute syntax. And then Microsoft started getting in there and now it's back to get element by ID is the cool thing to do. So whatever, it either works. Uh, and then adding a listener for this button. Right? That is just classic JavaScript. Now this is just working with the user interface. So I have this one little HTML page, bunch of styles, a table. It's totally old school, I told you it was old school. All right, so here, just a, a table. If I run this, that's all it is, right? You just fill out your name and the amount and what kind of account you want. And I could open it. And if I leave that in here or change it, right, then I can just keep depositing or withdrawing. And that's a yeah, very easy bank account. We don't check. We don't care if you're the mafia. You can put money in here. It's all, I'm keeping it all anyway. So it, here, just a table with HTML, nothing fancy in here. So it's in my TypeScript, it's just, oh, wrong TypeScript, this one. Uh, it's just get element by ID to grab some of those buttons, to uh, also grab some of the uh, inputs, right? So here I can actually go ahead and cast to an, or, you know, cast, right? So I can tell it to, I want to use it as an input element, right? For the text boxes, right? And then here, you know, just account type, I could grab what's in the drop down. All right, so this is a little mixture of, you know, I have a few TypeScript-y things in here, uh, but generally it's just plain JavaScript. So if you have a lot of JavaScript that manipulates the DOM, you don't have to run off and say, oh, well, I need to convert this to TypeScript now, just so TypeScript can compile it back to JavaScript. All right, you, you, if it works, don't fix it, it's not broken, right? Uh, if it doesn't work, then maybe you need to rewrite it, that, but that's different. Uh, so again, you can mix JavaScript and TypeScript, uh, and it goes the same thing here. So when I compile, whoo, so here I get some of my, right, so I get a nice big variable from the account that I'm using in that scope, and then it really, here it's just copied the code, right? So mo there's very few modifications in this, because I'm doing all DOM manipulation in this particular file that works with that little tiny HTML page. Uh, so you can have your mix. You can have types, so you can leave the JavaScript as is if you need, but if you convert it to TypeScript, it's still fine, right? So you can take that and start changing, you know, vars to lets and things like that, and maybe using some objects from TypeScript, but you don't have to throw it out, right? And then you could continue to use your classes as normal as you create object models in TypeScript. So did I miss anything? Now we got all of the good concepts from object orientation. Remember, it's not really a class under the, the scenes. Oh, also, you might see uh, for older code, newer code once in a while, this triple slash reference or an imports either works. Uh, this works for namespaces. If you just do a module, you can do export import, but you can use require or common or one of those to import modules. That's cool. Uh, a lot of folks doing node uh, use those. That's very popular, right? So classes are just objects, right? They're not a real class. Just rem keep that in mind. They're a dictionary. They have a prototype and under the scenes is the jungle of the prototype. Uh, any other stuff? I actually talked about all of this. We know how inheritance works, 
right? So if I have an account and inherits from its parent, gets all of those qualities, we've seen all that works, right? Conceptually, it works the same, right? And we've seen some of the code to create that. Yeah, I would much rather this top piece to write than the bottom piece. Uh, we saw super for referencing the base class. Uh, interfaces. Oh, um, there is a notion of overloads, um, but it does not work the same. So that's something you'll need to change. Uh, so here I have a few functions. And what will happen is this last one is the one that's actually going to be the actual method. And the other two are just basically like aliases. So unlike C Sharp, where you would walk through a debugger, and it would match up the types and, uh, types and number of arguments and go into that specific method, it doesn't do that in here. It just goes to that one base method that you have that last one declared. Uh, so you might do something like this, where you use it you know, with one, then the next, like the div element and element, but then a union type. All right, so I could have um, an option of either or um, for this. So that's kind of a way not to do optional types, but I can pick one of these two types as an argument. Uh, so that's a way to do overload. So it's not exactly the, not exactly the same. So just keep that in mind. Uh, for classes, uh, again, you saw this code just a bit ago. Uh, I can access the class and use it. Oh, yeah, the, the most easy thing. I almost forgot. So, of course, you probably want to change to let's, but new, just use the new keyword, right? Just like you would uh, in C Sharp, right? Or even in VB.net. And then, you know, object dot method, object dot property. So the usage syntax is the same. Right? So we saw all the defining. And after you see all the defining, you almost forget, yes, you need to use the class at some point. So here, it's just a new keyword to create, if you will, an instance, right? It's, remember, it's not a real class, but just to create that object so it's out and running in the wild. Uh, so as you can see, if you're writing C Sharp, it, TypeScript makes it pretty easy to come over into JavaScript and start doing business code right away. Now, if you're already working with the DOM, pure JavaScript is just fine. It is very DOM friendly, right? Now, the DOM in, it, in and of itself is a whole nother problem in which the guy who created jQuery, John Razik, actually created, I love this title, this talk title called The DOM is a Mess. <laughs> and I'm like, yes it is, right? Everybody blames JavaScript, but the DOM is actually, a, a sneaky little hooligan that causes a lot of problems and then blames everything on JavaScript. Uh, those, those DOMs, right? So that and JavaScript, right? But they work together well. Uh, but when we get to the business part, and nowadays, Vue, React, and those kind of frameworks, and a lot of front-end development is quite popular. So you often aren't just working with an API and business logic on the back end, a lot of business logic is being done on the front end, especially with native stuff, right? So if you're writing HTML, that's gonna run on a mobile, right? So you need to push some business logic down to that device sometimes. Uh, so, so that's where you might need this, right, TypeScript. Uh, for DOM manipulation, again, pure JavaScript's fine, but for that business stuff, the business rules, these frameworks, uh, TypeScript is something you probably wanna look at for a C-sharp developer. And I think I'm just a little bit off, right on time here. So I'll be around for questions. Uh, they'll probably wanna get the next presenter on quickly. Thank you for coming out and looking at that code before 11 a.m., right? Because I hate doing it, so thank you.